Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ahmed Ali and I'm one of the core surgical trainees in general surgery at Pinderfields Hospital. All right. So I'll be yeah. presenting today with Mr. Gidano Perrin, who is one of my registrars, and the moderator for today's session will be Prof. Saba. So the paper that we've selected is titled Pulmonary Recruitment Maneuver Reduce the Shoulder Pain and Nausea After Laparoscopic Cholecystectomy Randomized Control Trial. It's a study that was carried out in Sweden and was published in September of this year, um, online only so far in the World Journal of Surgery. So well, we, we do know from previous papers that we discussed and we've also probably all come across that there is a relationship between uh, CO2 insufflation and uh, pain. Uh, the degree on imoperitoneum, we know we've discussed this in episode 18 when we uh, touched on the PAROS trial, uh, does affect the degree of pain uh, and the degree uh, speed of recovery after a laparoscopic procedure. And we do also have some evidence from gynecological uh, surgery, mostly but also from bariatric surgery, that uh, an evacuation maneuver post-op uh, by a pulmonary recruitment <coughs> can actually help uh, and reduce uh, pain. And the two biological mechanisms that are supporting this uh, phenomenon are mechanical, so there's less volume in the abdomen, therefore less stretch, therefore less pain, and biochemical. Uh, CO2, as you know, when gets in contact with water, gets turned into carbonic acid that obviously can dissociate and cause acidity, which is a known factor that can um, cause pain. So I'll just give you a quick introduction to the aims of the study, as mentioned by the authors. So they were hoping to investigate the post-operative pain and as a secondary measure, nausea as well. Uh, when performing a ventilator, a ventilator piloted pulmonary recruitment maneuver at the end of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So they only included uh, elective cases in this, um, in this study. So if we use a PICO format to just outline their aim, uh, we can say that the patients are those undergoing an elective uh, lap cole. The intervention was whether they received a pulmonary recruitment maneuver or not, in addition to just applying um, gentle pressure to the abdomen. And the remover that uh, the maneuver that they performed was six breaths over a one minute period with a total pressure of 40 centimeters of water. And the comparison that they have is whether the group received the PRM maneuver or not. Um, and the outcome is the overall pain in 48 hours. Yeah, sure. So, you... uh, so uh, they designed this as a prospective, <coughs> uh, which is redundant as a word itself, double blind randomized control trial. Uh, this was carried on between 2014 and 2018, October to December. And inclusion criteria, as Ahmed kind of mentioned, are uh, being an adult, so 18 years old or older, ASA 1 or 2, uh, which means basically minimal amount of comorbidities, and having an elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy for symptomatic, non-complicated gallstone disease, which means excluding cases of pancreatitis, cases of um, cholecystitis uh, or CBD stones. Also of note, uh, where the authors conducted this trial, uh, in order to have a, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you have to be smoke-free for six months, uh, which is quite impressive and probably a great way of cutting the waiting list for the NHS as well. Um, enrollment was consecutive, so everybody that was coming through the door and having an operation, and randomization was conducted in blocks. And as Ahmed mentioned, uh, the two groups are passive evacuation plus uh, pulmonary recruitment maneuver uh, versus a simple passive evacuation. Uh, Double blinding um, means obviously patient and assessor uh, were blinded to the intervention uh, surgeon, although it would potentially be possible, it would be quite difficult to do and the authors didn't attempt it. Um, so uh, ball back to you, Ahmed. Yeah, so just elaborating on the methods that we've just created a simple flow diagram just to illustrate everything. So it's important to know that preoperatively all of the patients received oral uh, paracetamol as their analgesia of choice. And as the patient was taken to theatre and was anaesthetised, they were also had an envelope with them which was handed over to the anaesthetist. And this had the allocation from the randomisation 
um, sequence to see which intervention, or whether they'd receive the intervention or whether they'd re receive the control. And postoperatively, the patients would complete questionnaires over a 48 hour period, which were then assessed and uh, put into the database by a different individual. So the patients uh, and, and the people present during the procedure were, were not aware of the outcomes from, uh, from their questionnaires. So we talked about the preoperative analgesia, which was paracetamol. It's important to know that there were some differences in the anesthetic choices that they had. So induction was either remifentanil and propofol or alfentanil and thiopentol, depending on whether the patients had gourd or not. If they did suffer from gourd, the latter option was used. Maintenance uh, throughout the procedure also remained the same from an analgesic perspective where everybody received remifentanil. However, from a hypnotic perspective, patients either received propofol or sevoflurin. All of the patients at the end of the operation received local anesthetic, which was 20 ml of bupivacaine hydrochloride, five milligrams per five ml, plus adrenaline, five micrograms per milliliter. In addition to that, analgesia was also prophylactically administer, administered to all of the patients. They all received 30 milligrams of IV Keterolac, which is a very strong NSAID that's not particularly used here in the, in the United Kingdom, um, plus or minus additional IV morphine as well. In anticipation for the nausea and vomiting that the patients might experience, they also administered IV antiemetics. All of the patients received IV droperidol plus IV betamethasone, Again, both of these aren't too commonly used here in the UK. And if the patients had a background of post-operative uh, nausea and vomiting, they were given an additional dose of IV and Um Post-operatively, uh, the patients received, again, paracetamol, QDS as a regular medication. And if they required some additional analgesia, they had uh, five milligrams of oxycodone offered to them. Again, it doesn't really follow the analgesic bladder, whereas here in, in, in this country, we would typically or work our way up by giving them ibuprofen, codeine, etc. And if the patients did feel any nausea or any uh, did suffer from any vomiting, they could also receive PRN on Dancetron. So, Chia, do you just want to quickly talk about the outcomes? Of course. So, um, as mentioned earlier on, I just want to stress this out a little bit more. The primary outcome of this study <coughs> is overall pain. It uh, doesn't matter what the pain is, it's overall pain. And particularly at the mean pain score at 48 hours uh, as measured throughout the postoperative period. Um, it is important to point this out because this is what uh, they use to uh, perform the uh, sample size calculation. And they presume that there will be a two point difference in favor of the pulmonary recruitment maneuver um, against uh, standard treatment. Uh, and they calculate that they need about 69 patients per group. And there are some uh, consequences of this that we'll talk about later, but uh, yeah, remember this for the moment. Secondary outcomes are nausea and vomiting, uh, and uh, a shoulder pain and wound pain. And this is measured at 4, 12, 24, 36 hours. And uh, obviously everything is measured in uh, VAS. A variety of other secondary outcomes are also included, such as uh, analgesic use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about some of them uh, in more details later on. So just highlighting the, the patients that were recruited initially and those that were actually analysed in the end. So 260 patients were initially randomised into the two groups, 130 each. However, there were certain exclusions and patients that were not analysed, either because the patients didn't receive the intervention, either they were excluded after being reassessed and they realised that their patients didn't meet the eligibility, eligibility criteria, or if they had an extra surgical intervention, ERCP, or have any complications, um, as discussed before. There was quite a significant number that were lost to follow up in both groups as well, as we can see. But the number of individuals in each group ended up being 76 individuals in the intervention group and 71 in the control group. Um, therefore, sort of meeting the requirement of at least 69 patients in each uh, based on the sample size uh, calculation. Yeah. So, so um, as mentioned, the overall pain um, is the primary outcome and it, there is no difference between the two groups in terms of incidence or intensity, nor uh, as um, mean um, overall the 48 hour period or as uh, any time points where this outcome was evaluated, as you can see from the chart. And this is quite important to highlight because if you just read the conclusion of the paper, um, this might escape you. Um, and we'll talk about it later. So ball uh, to you, Ahmed. <coughs> 
So just talking about the secondary outcomes that were investigated. So in addition to the overall pain that patients were experiencing, the incidence of shoulder pain was also measured between the two groups. And it was found that it was significantly lower in the PRM intervention group compared to the control. Nausea was also assessed in both and it was found to be significantly lower in the PRM group, and it also had a significantly lower intensity. But it's important to know that the intensity reported in both groups was quite low, as you can see on the graph on the right-hand side, so one to two out of the 10-point scale that they used. They also recorded the number of patients that have vomited four hours post-op. So 0% of the patients in the intervention group vomited, whereas 13% did in the control group. Again, a significant difference. And mobility was also assessed to see uh, how comfortable the patients were at post-operatively at four hours. And again, there's a significantly high number of people that were able to mobilize in the intervention group compared to the control. Um, so we'll just be talking about the limitations of this study next. And the research group commented on three limitations in themselves. One being the varying post-operative care based on the, the individuals that were receiving the analgesia and the anti-emetics. And as an additional measure, they noticed that some patients were also administered NSAIDs as well uh, in both of the groups. It's important to know that in their results section, they did comment on this and they measured the number of patients that were receiving all of these medications and, it was, and there was no significant difference between the two groups. They were also able to appreciate that exclusion after randomization is also a limitation. And as we discussed before, there was a difference in the types of anaesthetic that the patients had received. Yeah, you... so um, the first of sort of the other limitations listed here is kind of redundant. Um, but just to stress out that the primary outcome was actually not different between the two groups. Uh, if you just read the title and uh, the conclusion of the paper as it's written, this doesn't seem to transpire very much. Um, there is definitely a halo effect here. Uh, Ahmed explained very well how the um, postoperative analgesic uh, protocols is based on a PRM set of medications. And obviously, uh, if you know that a study is going on, um, even if you're blinded to what um, intervention the patient had, you're going to be keen to ask more if they need such medication. Uh, the primary outcome is obviously um, subjective to a certain extent, although it's evaluated in a, in a standardized way. Um, it's a limitation, but is also a pretty standard way of doing it throughout the literature. So I don't think we can criticize them too much for that. Um, the main point that I think we should highlight is that there are a lot of external validity issues. Now, um, starting from pre-op, uh, patients are heavily selected. Uh, as I mentioned, only elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy for uncomplicated Gorston disease. That would, at the moment, take out of the picture pretty much the vast majority of lap colis that we do. Um, also, people that, need, that, that can be enrolled need not to smoke for six months. Again, that's not really practical here. It's not something we can do. Um, intraoperatively, they say that um, uh, the operation can be carried out by uh, any sort of level surgeon, trainee, uh, or, uh, or fully trained surgeon. So this does have some sort of pragmatism to it. Uh, but they also perform a cholangiogram as a standard procedure. And they do perform an ERCT intraoperatively or the following day after the operation, which again is not something that we do, we would do, or most surgeons would do uh, an OCC only if they think it's needed. Uh, and postoperatively, they use medications that we normally not use. Fitorolic is a fantastic drug, but we don't really have it readily available uh, in this country. Um, they also excluded BMA from ASA. So um, morbid obesity would not give you an ASA score, which normally it does. And I'm not entirely sure why they've done that. Um, there is a high dropout rate, which led them to, uh, because they identified that halfway through the trial, um, increase the recruitment number and then end up with slightly over-recruited groups, 76 and 71 versus the 69, and versus 69 they were originally planning. Yeah, so I think a conclusion that we can uh, take from this study is that a pulmonary recruitment manoeuvre should be recommended to re reduce post-operative nausea and shoulder pain. Um, and then we've just summarised the main points uh, in the table below as well. So thank you very much. As usual, a brief summary of the discussion session. So as I highlighted a few times throughout the presentation, we feel that it is important to highlight 
that the primary outcome of this study was overall pain after the surgical procedure. And for this particular outcome, there was no difference between the two groups. We should always be careful about the interpretation of p-values and statistical significance in secondary outcomes of a randomized clinical trial. Uh, a further very important point that we discussed is related to the intention to treat principle uh, and external validity. Particularly two groups of patients we feel should have been included in the main analysis. And this would be patients that suffered from a complication and patients that uh, underwent an ERCP following identification of CBD stones. Given that uh, if randomization is effective, these two groups should be equally distributed between the two arms of the study. Uh, I think in a pragmatic intention to treat randomized clinical trial, they should not be excluded, particularly uh, as this happened after randomization. An option would have been for the authors to present both results with and without those patients. Furthermore, it is difficult to particularly pinpoint um, why there has been a reduction in the shoulder pain in intervention group and a reduction of wound pain in the control group. And we feel that the number of variables implicated in this phenomenon might be beyond, could be appreciated uh, in, uh, in this particular context. And finally, uh, philosophical issues that relates to the need for this particular RCT. The authors published a previous study on bariatric surgical patients, which highlighted how um, overall pain was reduced in presence of the pulmonary recruitment maneuver. So the argument would be that uh, uh, this should be easily translatable into uh, any other laparoscopic procedure, really. Uh, there are two issues here. One is that uh, the population in the previous study is specifically bariatric, uh, and this might not be applicable, uh, applicable to a different population. And furthermore, there is the issue of replicability. And this trial actually shows how the results that the authors picked up on the previous study are not replicable in this context, as the overall pain, as mentioned earlier on, is not different between the two groups. Right, I'll leave you to uh, Professor Saba lecture on evidence-based medicine. Thank you. So I thought we will um, we'll talk about um, evidence-based practice in general, and uh, um, I thought we should do a few um, few sessions on just discussing um, or giving an introduction to evidence-based practice. Okay, so this is the first of those uh, talks. So what we'll talk about today is um, go over what evidence-based practice is or what ABM is, and why. We as surgeons and, and, and trainees need to practice evidence-based medicine, and I'll go through some pitfalls in evidence-based based medicine that we need to think about. And I'm sure all of you have heard of this uh, phrase, evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice, and uh, I thought it would be helpful to just refresh some of these basic concepts. Right, so uh, here's the definition of evidence-based practice, right? This was from uh, one of David Sackett's uh, paper. He is considered as one of the fathers of evidence-based practice. And he said, um, this is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current, current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And then he went on to say that this is uh, integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Okay, so let's just uh, dwell on that a little bit. So essentially, he says, you make use of, oops, there you go. You make use of clinical expertise and best available evidence, put them together along with what the patient would like to have done. And that, in a sense, will help you practice evidence-based medicine. In other words, it'll help you make decisions uh, about the care of your patients. Now, what is a clinical expertise? Now, let's just take something um, that most surgical trainees would be familiar with, um, i.e. the setting of acute appendicitis. And let's just think about the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. Now, the di in the diagnosis of acute appendicitis, I'm sure you'll agree that um, there is expertise involved. And this expertise incorporates clinical judgment and also proficiency. 
and you get judgment and tradition, say, from knowledge, knowledge about the anatomy of the appendix, the physiology and pathophysiology of uh, appendicitis, the natural history, and so on. And you get, um, uh, you also get better by practice, by seeing more and more patients with the right iliac fossa pain. And with the experience, you are able to make better judgments. Okay, so that's uh, common sense. Now, you, what we are saying, or what the proponents of EDM say, is that this alone isn't sufficient. And you also need to draw upon a, a data or uh, evidence on diagnostic tests to be able to then decide which diagnostic accuracy studies. There may even be clinical signs, like the SOAS sign or the Rothsing sign, or blood tests like the CRP and white cell count, or clinical scores like the AAR score, and um, uh, studies on imaging and so on. So um, it's important to keep ourselves up to date with the evidence base, in addition to the expertise that we gain with practice and experience, to then decide what to do next in a patient presenting with acute appendicitis. And last but not the least, you have to fit in um, or, or include uh, or incorporate patient values in your decision making. It may not necessarily fit in with what you consider best as the next thing to do. For example, if you're thinking of a CT scan and the patient wants to particularly avoid exposure to radiation, uh, you will need to um, uh, accommodate the expectations and the preferences. Not to mention specific uh, issues that are uh, um, important in individual patients, like allergies to contrast or uh, morbid obesity and so on and so forth when you're deciding on, uh, let's say, doing a CT scan. Okay, so uh, why is this important? Now, traditionally, and uh, we have relied on books. We've relied on received wisdom and how things are generally done in the place that you did your, uh, uh, your training. And you often hear people talking about our experience. In our unit, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. And it's always worked for us. Now, that, the problem with that is, uh, as you might imagine, um, that is considered inadequate. And if you move from one unit to another, you might find that the practices are very different practices with regards to diagnosing appendicitis. And um, I hope you'll agree that this is also an unreliable um, sort of set of uh, uh, evidence to base your decisions on. Now, the other issue is that people would always say, uh, people would often say in the past, when I say past, I mean several decades ago, that uh, you know, this particular test should work because it makes biological sense. There is this pathophysiological rationale for this. But um, basing your decisions on mechanistic explanations or pathophysiology is, is uh, often unreliable. And that's why you need evidence-based medicine because evidence-based medicine tells you to rely on empiric data, not just on theory. Has it actually worked in the real world? Uh, has it actually been tried in patients and what have the results shown you, okay? And, and uh, um, expertise alone, um, uh, clinical expertise alone, as we've discussed, is inadequate to guide your decisions without uh, empiric data. A lot of people would say, uh, oh, I base my decisions on my experience, but that experience is also empiric data and experience is not great data because, as you might imagine, it often uh, depends on um, your recollection of your um, of uh, your experience. And there's good evidence to suggest that if you ignore uh, empiric data, uh, your outcomes may not be optimal. Right. So um, one of the other problems with clinical expertise is that although with more and more practice and experience, your clinical judgment will improve, your skills, your diagnostic skills, and also in surgery, your technical skills will improve. With experience, with just experience alone, your knowledge of the evidence base may not improve. And actually with age, uh, your knowledge uh, um, with, or your staying up to date with current knowledge may actually decline. You can obviously avoid this 
are regularly refreshing your evidence base. Uh, but there is uh, reasonably good data that shows that um, with age, performance might decline. And that's largely due to people not keeping up with the knowledge base. Right. So, um, so these are some of the reasons why we need to think about um, evidence-based medicine and see what best we can do um, to, to practice evidence-based medicine. So um, finding the evidence, understanding the evidence, and then incorporating the evidence, the results of the papers that you read into your practice uh, is therefore very important but doing this in an effective manner is actually quite difficult because there's a lot of evidence out there and uh, uh, finding the good quality, right evidence that answers your questions requires a lot of time and effort. And that process is simplified, I believe, by a good understanding. If you really understand the principles of evidence-based medicine and apply it regularly, then the time and effort is actually minimized, okay? Now, the first thing you need to think about um, to set about practicing evidence-based medicine in your day-to-day -day clinical work is to first think about the kind of questions, your clinical questions, uh, where you need help um, from evidence-based medicine, clinical questions uh, that need uh, answering in your day-to-day -day practice. And just thinking of appendicitis, I've made a list of a few questions here. So the first question is, can I improve the accuracy of the diagnosis of appendicitis, right? The second question is, does post-operative use of antibiotics reduce infection? Then you've got a question that asks, uh, are, do trainees do as well as consultants, or maybe better than consultants, when it comes to looking at outcomes after appendicectomy? Then you might be interested in what's the right way or the optimal way, if there is one right way of securing the base of the appendix. Is post-operative follow-up and secondary care necess necessary, or can you just discharge patients back to the GP um, after appendicectomy? If you don't do an operation, what can I use to predict recurrence after conservative management? So these are examples of clinical questions that address practical problems. Now you could, if you're really interested, ask about uh, ask questions such as what causes appendicitis. What does the appendix do in terms of uh, its role in the um, immunological system and its response to bacteria in the gut? Now, these questions aren't necessarily addressing practical problems. They are important, they are interesting, but they're not necessarily practical, right? So these kinds of questions are what are referred to as background questions in, in the realm of um, evidence-based practice. The questions that we discussed about, the, the, the list about, are referred to as foreground questions. So when you were reading about evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine, you might come across these kinds of questions called background questions and foreground questions. Now, just focusing on the foreground questions, and that's what we're going to do now, it is useful to classify these foreground questions into three or four main groups. The first uh, group is questions about diagnosis, and this also includes screening. So is one diagnostic test better than the other? That'd be a typical question. The second group is about uh, interventions and their efficacy and effectiveness. So this falls under the category of therapy and prevention. So is, for example, laparoscopic appendicectomy better than open appendicectomy? That would be a question. Is um, uh, so one analogies here better than the other, one set of antibiotics um, better than the other, and so on and so forth. The third uh, kind of question um, uh, or group of questions, clinical questions that are practical um, would fall into the category of prognosis. So what's the prognosis of uh, this particular condition or what's the natural history uh, of, uh, of a particular sort of complication? And then there's another miscellaneous group that includes questions relating to etiology, harm, quality of care, quality of life, costs, and so on and so forth. Some of these uh, overlap quite significantly with uh, the first three groups that we discussed on diagnosis, therapy, and prognosis. So grouping these questions 
then would lead you to uh, look for the appropriate study design or the ideal study design that will help you answer the question. And here we're talking about primary research. We're not talking about secondary research or systematic reviews where you group all uh, primary research on a particular question and then try and collate the evidence and come up with a summa summary or a summative answer. So for example, for diagnostic and screening questions, the ideal study would be a prospective uh, study with a um, blind comparison with your standard. For therapy questions, questions relating to treatment, a randomized controlled trial, as you would um, expect, for prognosis and prediction, uh, you are going to need a cohort study. And uh, in the other, the miscellaneous category, it really depends on the type of question. For example, for questions relating to incidence or etiology, you would want a cohort study to answer that question. For questions on prevalence, a cross-sectional study would be ideal. And, and uh, for questions on the other um, issues like harm and quality of life and cost, the study design really depends on the kind of question, but usually a randomized controlled trial would be appropriate. Now we'll talk about these study designs uh, in, a, in, a, in a later talk, uh, but I thought I should introduce you to clinical questions and, and the ideal study design for different types of clinical questions. Okay, so now um, a few things to keep in mind when, when talking about evidence-based medicine. Now. There's a lot of focus on what we call empiric um, evidence. Empiric evidence relates to evidence that um, uh, uh, evidence from the real world, uh, evidence from data that is observed, right? So, and the and the many proponents of evidence-based medicine base uh, all of their arguments around uh, having empiric evidence, and very often ignore mechanistic evidence, by which I mean. If there's good um, pathophysiological rationale that something will work, uh, that often gets ignored um, with, with the proponent saying, well, there is no RCT evidence, and therefore we're not going to employ that treatment. Now, this is often a problem in medical practice in, uh, when, when you deal with drugs and medications. But in surgery, uh, we have tended to um, go with the, uh, with the practice that if something is likely to work, we, we, we just get on with it. And a really good example of this in, in general surgery is the adoption of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Now, laparoscopic cholecystectomy very rapidly became the, the norm or the standard um, in dealing with um, uh, Goldstone disease without um, randomized controlled trial evidence saying that laparoscopy is better than open uh, cholecystectomy. And that was because the benefits were very, very obvious. The, the rationale was there. You didn't have to do a big muscle cutting incision and that increased inflammation and mobility and so on. So there was so much um, uh, mechanistic uh, explanation for it that we didn't really wait for uh, the gold standard randomized control trial to come along to show that laparoscopy is better. Um, however, so, so, so the, the point here uh, is that you should not ignore, I think, the, the pathophysiological rationale, although if there's empiric evidence that that is much better, you should always consider the, the uh, mechanisms as to how an intervention uh, would work, as opposed to just seeing if it works in the real world. Now, if you are writing a protocol for a Cochrane review, if you're doing a systematic review and meta-analysis as part of a Cochrane review, you will find that the Cochrane um, want you to write about uh, mechanistic evidence. They want you to write a paragraph or two about how the intervention might work. So obviously people do give uh, importance to um, uh, mechanistic evidence, uh, at least the importance it deserves. Right, the second thing to think about is you may have all come across this, this pyramid, this pyramid of studies that uh, gives you uh, an idea of the importance of different study designs and the levels of evidence they provide in helping you make a particular decision. Now, uh, you might have uh, come across this problem and the problem is that 
and many of the proponents of EBM and uh, would love you to think that the RCT evidence is the best available evidence. It often is, but not always. Now, uh, a poorly performed randomized controlled trial might actually not be that worthwhile or less worthwhile than a well done cohort study. And that's often ignored. And um, often evidence from a randomized controlled trial, however poorly um, it may be done, is used to bin or shut down really good quality observational um, evidence. Uh, and then that's something um, you need to be aware of. Right. Another thing is uh, uh, in, in uh, another problem, if you like, in the practice of evidence based medicine is this thing called the inferential gap. So, what is this? Now, if you're drawing evidence for, from randomized controlled trials to make a particular decision, you need to keep in mind that these randomized controlled trials are often done in patients, in selected patients, patients who fit very neatly your inclusion and exclusion criteria that the trial, that the people who designed the trial um, have, have uh, uh, implemented or laid down. And therefore, the results may not necessarily be applicable or generalizable to patients who do not fit those inclusion and exclusion criteria in patients with some unique problems or complicated uh, um, circumstances. Now, for example, let's talk about appendicitis. And if you're planning to do a CT for a patient with the right headache force of pain to be able to diagnose appendicitis, and you've come across this meta-analysis and review, a Cochrane review that says a CT scan is, is, is uh, one of the best tools that there is, and the diagnosis of appendicitis is highly sensitive, highly specific, so it really trumps ultrasound and, and all your clinical um, scores and CRP and what have you. Uh, that may not necess necessarily be true for the patient in front of you because the patient in front of you might not be uh, the kind of patient that is, has been included in the RCTs. For example, you might have a patient that has got contrast and allergy, and therefore you can't do the standard enhanced CT scan, you might have to do a, a non-contrast CT scan. And the trials in the meta-analysis may not have studied a non-contrast CT scan. It may also be that you have a patient that does not like uh, exposure to radiation and would like to be treated or managed without any exposure to radiation. Or the patient might be super obese that, is not, that does not fit into your hospital CT scanner. Or, and therefore, the, 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 uh, you have a problem, you have a lot of evidence on a particular uh, diagnostic modality or treatment, but you just can't apply that to the patient in front of you. And for many treatments, from many settings, you will find that randomized controlled trials have actually excluded a significant proportion of patients uh, that you will come across in day-to-day -day practice. And that's what is referred to as the inferential gap. Okay. The other uh, thing to think about is this difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. Clinical significance is the, is the difference that matters to the clinician and the patient. Statistical significance simply refers to the p-value, the probability that the observed results are due to chance. Okay, so it's important to understand the difference and we might cover that again in another uh, session. So if you have a small trial, you may have some important clinical differences between groups. But because the trial is small and the numbers aren't great, you might not get the magical P of less than 0 0.05. On the uh, other end of the uh, problem, you might have very large administrative data sets that are being used to address specific questions. And they might, uh, the results from those studies might give you a significant p-value very easily, even if there is not much difference between, between arms. So even if the clinical uh, uh, improvement is only marginal or the clinical effect size is very low, you'll get a significant p-value. So, so that's something to be aware of. The other issue with trials particularly is that trials tend to um, measure outcomes or tend to focus on primary outcomes that are easily measured not primary outcomes, not outcomes that need to be measured. And often trials will use surrogate outcomes because waiting for the final all important uh, outcome that matters to patients might make the trial too expensive or too lengthy. And in many trials, outcomes 
uh, do not reflect, even secondary outcomes do not reflect uh, what patients would like to be uh, like to be informed about. And the last thing to keep in mind is that um, is that the issue with the reporting bias. So articles with negative results don't get published or are published in very low impact factor journals and they don't and don't necessarily reach a wide audience. And um, and the fact that there are there are many many studies in the, lit in the literature, including randomized control trials and the systematic reviews and meta analysis, that are poorly done, and the quality of evidence is rather poor. But just because it is published, people will start to quote the uh, systematic review or the meta analysis and uh, uh, base uh, the results of that poorly conducted uh, study to guide their decisions. Okay, so we've come to the end of this, um, this uh, talk. So to summarize, we talked about what evidence-based practice or medicine means. Um, I hope uh, I've explained um, why it's useful for us to practice evidence-based medicine and how it helps us in our, in our decision-making. We went through some kinds of questions that EBM can help in answering. We talked about background questions and foreground questions and how foreground questions can be grouped into different categories, like questions addressing diagnosis, questions addressing prognosis, and, uh, and so on. We then talked about some of the pitfalls of evidence-based practice. So um, keep in mind that we shouldn't ignore pathophysiological explanations and mechanisms and, and, and then only focus on empiric data, we shouldn't do that. Uh, you should be aware that RCTs may be poorly done and that observational studies uh, that are done really well might be better than uh, RCTs in many instances. We talked about the inferential gap where the results of RCTs don't necessarily apply to patients in front of you. We talked about um, statistical versus clinical significance and how we should be focusing on clinical significance. We talked about outcomes and that are not necessarily important. That can be the focus of trials. And we talked about low quality evidence and reporting bias. So that's it, that's it for this talk. I hope that was useful. If you do have any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.